Thank you for taking the time to watch today's video. But before we get started, go ahead and subscribe to this channel and check out our backlog of great content for you guys. And then also consider hitting this join button, becoming a channel member today. You get all kinds of perks and things like that. And if this video was a blessing to you, don't forget to click the link below and make a donation in the PayPal. God bless you, friend, and we appreciate you. May God speak to your heart during this video. This is heresy. The Bible says in Proverbs 2, verse 1, My son, if thou wilt receive my words and hide my commandments with thee, so that thou incline thine ear unto wisdom and, pl and apply thine heart to understanding. Yea, if thou criest after knowledge and liftest up thy voice for understanding, if thou seekest after her as silver and searchest for her as for hid treasures, then shalt thou understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. What a statement. What a statement. And uh, I want to speak to you today on the knowledge of God. It's a very valuable thing, something that we must have. And sadly, a lot of people go through life without it, not even seeking for it, not even seeing the value in the knowledge of God, knowing who God is and knowing God himself. And uh, we're going to try to talk about that for a little while. Would you pray with me? I want you to know that wisdom and knowledge and understanding are like this holy trinity that I see throughout all the Bible. It seems like whenever you see wisdom, understanding, and uh, knowledge are not far behind. They're always somehow clumped together. And in verse number 2 of Proverbs 2 says this, So that thou incline thine ear unto, what's that word there? Wisdom. wisdom. I circled that in my Bible. And apply thine heart into, what's the next word there? understanding yea if thou criest after what y'all aren't y'all aren't awake this morning look to your neighbor and say how you doing all right turn back to your other neighbor and say leave me alone and uh, very good and uh, you, some of you men been wanting to say that to your wife for years and I gave you the chance to say it praise God uh, but uh, it says there in verse number three yea if thou criest after what knowledge knowledge I want you to know that the knowledge that it speaks about there is, in a sense, understanding and knowing who God is and what He's like. And um, I'll, I'll give an illustration tonight about why you need knowledge and understanding and wisdom, and I hope you'll come back tonight. I don't understand these, uh, brother, brother Chris, I don't understand these Sunday morning people. They, 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 they make me scratch my head sometimes, but tonight we'll talk about that a little bit. But I want you to know that uh, knowledge is the ability to read the Scriptures so that you can get an idea of the sense of who God is, so that you can know what He's like, so that you can please Him with your life. That really is what is going on, uh, what, what the Bible teaches is knowledge right there. I wrote this quote down, someone said this, uh, to know this book, you, you try to know this book so that you can know God, and that you know God so that you can come to love God. And that's where we're at today. A lot of people are uh, struggling in this world because they don't know who God is. They don't know anything about Him. And I'm not speaking about people that are off in some foreign land. I'm talking about people in the pews and good churches have no knowledge of who God is, of His character, of what He's like, of what He loves and what He hates. And they just go along just, uh, just taking shots in the dark, just doing things and hoping God accepts it. And I'm going to tell you something right there. If you don't have any knowledge of who God is, any knowledge of the character of of God, any knowledge of the nature of God. If you don't get in this book and learn who God is and try to understand God, that you will never please Him and you'll never truly know the wonderful thing that we call God. Amen. I look there in that passage of Scripture. It says in verse number 3, Yea, if thou criest after knowledge and lifteth up thy voice for understanding, if thou seekest her as silver. Now here's the problem today. A lot of people are out there looking for a few dollars. They're looking to get rich in this world. But true riches are not found in a dollar amount. True riches are found in what the Bible says are wisdom and understanding and knowledge. And verse number four, if thou seekest her as silver and searchest for her as for hid treasures, then shalt thou understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. And I want to tell you today, that's the problem with a lot of folks. And I want to do this. I want to, I want to give you three points this morning because that's what I do. I'm a three-point preacher and an outline and a poem and a tap dance and an invitation and an offering. That's what I do. And uh, so we're going to do that this morning. I want to tell you this, that if you don't have the knowledge of God in your life, any knowledge of God, then you can never get saved. 
never get saved. I want you to go over, we're going to go to the New Testament real quick. Let's go to Romans chapter 1. And I told you Wednesday night that Romans chapter 1, I call it the road to hell because it is the road to hell. And America is going down the Romans chapter 1 road. And if you, if you go watch the Democratic Party and see the things that they're saying, you'll understand that, man, they're, they're going down this road so fast, it is frightening. And quite and to be honest with you, the Republican Party is not far behind. Uh, the, I don't have any faith in any politician. The only thing we can do politically is vote for somebody who's going to allow us to preach the gospel for just a few more years and kick the judgment of God down the road a few years and maybe give us a reprieve of the impending doom that's upon this nation. That's all we can do as far as voting. Amen. And Trump is not my savior. Trump is a fallen man, and I get that. But I'm a, I believe we ought to vote for a platform that gives us the opportunity to keep the, the old Titanic that is sinking called America afloat for a few more years. That's about all we can do. And I want to show you this. Romans chapter 1, the Bible says in verse number 27, it uh, talks about, And likewise also the men leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one towards another, men with men working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves the recompense of their error which was meat. And by the way, let me just say, you're not born that way, sir. You're a reprobate. You're filthy. You're wicked. You're in sin. That's what the Bible says. There is no such thing as I was just born this way. You need to be born again if you were born that way. That's wickedness, it's sin, and I'm sick to death. I'm sick to death of the bunch of p***s out there putting this in every single TV show. I'm sick to death that they give them a whole month and they give veterans who died and bled for this country a day. I'm sick to death of all this junk being promoted through mainstream media and through television and entertainment. You can't turn on a TV show for children without seeing a bunch of homosexuals everywhere. You, listen, you're going to fry like a sausage in hell is what you're going to do. Amen. Wickedness is what that is. And the Bible says that they're that way because the verse number 28, even as they did not like to retain God in their what? They, don't, they hate God. They don't, want, they don't want anything to do with God. God can show up and they're, they're like this. I don't want to see that. And I want to tell you this, if, if, you want the, if you go into a courthouse and you see the Ten Commandments there and it makes you mad, you are not some sort of se secular you know, uh, purist. You're, you're not that. You're just a hater of God. Amen. This whole separation of church and state nonsense. You are an atheist. You are a God hater. And you don't want God in the courthouse because you are a criminal and you hate God. Amen. And so we have people here that they don't even want God in their knowledge. Look what it says, verse 28. Even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. Now that ought to scare you to death. Amen. There are people out here in this world that don't want to hear preaching. They, don't want, they, they, they may come to church just out of some sort of social obligation. But when a man gets up and preaches truth, they get mad and they wave their fist at their creator. They deny their creator. Even in the book of Hebrews, it says they, they, cause, they, they trample over the blood of Jesus. You breathe in the breath that God gives you and you use that breath to cuss God. I want to tell you something right now. There is a point where you can cross a line with all that stuff. There is a point where you can shake your fist at God so long that God will say, okay. That ought to scare you to death. That ought to, that ought to frighten you. There are people in this world that have so said no to God so hard and for so long, and God just says, fine, you want to go to hell? Go to hell then. Oh, that's an awful thing, isn't it? But it's what they're doing. I want you to see also in 1 Timothy chapter 2 that uh, even though there is a crowd out there that uh, they don't like God, they don't want to hear about God, I want to tell you that doesn't change God's mind. God still wants men to be saved. Well, the Bible says here in 1 Timothy chapter number 2 that uh, uh, verse number 3, I don't know how the Reformed crowd gets past these verses here, verse 3 and 4 of 1 Timothy chapter 2, but the Bible says, For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be what? I love that word, saved, S-A-V-E-D, saved. I believe the saddest word in all the Bible is the word lost, lost. But I think the greatest and happiest word in all the Bible is that word saved, amen. God, who will have all men to be saved and come unto the what? 
knowledge of the truth. Praise God. I thank God for the day that somebody gave me the knowledge of the truth. I'm glad for the day that somebody gave me an understanding. Somebody gave me some biblical information that I was able to pierce my soul and told me that Jesus Christ loved me, but that I was a sinner. I came to the knowledge of that through a personal soul winner. And they told me about Christ. And they gave me a verse, Romans 10, 13. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And when I was 18 years old, I realized that I was a sinner and that I was lost without God and that I needed, I needed, I needed something. There was no way that I could get to heaven on my own. And that night I got on my knees at the Peachtree Road Baptist Church in Swanee, Georgia, and I received Jesus Christ as my Savior. I came to the knowledge of the truth that Jesus would save me. Amen. And that's why I've made almost, I think, I think this next trip to Kenya in, uh, in next month in September, I believe that's going to be my 30th mission trip. Praise God. That's a lot of sky miles. Amen. And a lot of hours sitting on a plane in a little cramped, tiny seat. They don't make airline seats for normal people. <laughs> Makes me mad. I I'd vote for a communist who will regulate the size of them seats. I don't care. I've made all them trips over there overseas because I want people to be saved and I want to give that knowledge of the truth. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, flip over there with me just a few pages back. We find here that, uh, uh, that we're supposed to preach the gospel and that this world is lost in the darkness of their sin. And the Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter number 4, and uh, we'll start in verse number 3, the Bible says, but if our gospel be hid... It is hid to them that are lost. There's that word again. Oh, that word. And whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. Uh, verse number 6 where I want to key in on. For God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the what? knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Amen. Just like God said in the book of Genesis chapter 1, let there be light. The same God who created this world is the same God that commands us to go out and to shine the light of the glorious gospel in this old dark and wicked world. And listen, I'm going to tell you something today. This world is dark. This whole world life and wickedness. TV is dark. You just watch the news at night and see how dark this old world is. People killing each other, robbing from each other, stealing from each other. I mean, just doing heinous wickedness all across this world. I mean, there are things going on that you and I don't know about that make Jeffrey Epstein look like some sort of nursery rhyme, friend. I'm going to tell you, this world is wicked, this world is evil, and, and God's going to judge this world. He's going to, he's going to torch this thing. And quite frankly, I can't blame him. I think God will be right and just in doing so. But in the midst of the darkness, there ought to be somebody saying, Hey, hey, don't go that way. Hey, hey, there is a, there is a light, friend. There's a light. You need to know that there's a Savior who loves you. Praise God. I believe uh, Levi talked about in Sunday school, pray for us, we're going to the jail today. And I'm thinking jail's a good place for Levi, amen. So, <laughs> but you know what they're going to go do? They're going to go preach the gospel in that jail. You know what they're going to do? They're going to go into a dark place and shine a light for a little while. And friend, I want to tell you right now, we, we, the knowledge of God is in a sense like a light. There's a, there's a world out there that has no idea who Jesus is. They've never even heard the name Jesus. And, and there's people out there who are dying in their sin. And I'm not talking about people in some foreign land. I'm talking about people here. That if you, if you show, if you, I mean, give them a Bible and say, take your Bible, turn to the book of John. They don't even know where to go. Matter of fact, there's some people in churches that don't even know where to go. And matter of fact, when I first got saved, there, I, uh, one of the very first services I went to, I had a little pocket New Testament about the size of a deck of cards, and I went to church with that, and it was the wrong translation and everything, so pray for me. Uh, but I, uh, I went to church with that little thing, and, and the guy, the evangelist got up and said, take your Bible to the book of 1 John. And I didn't know there was two Johns in the Bible, so I went to the Gospel of John. I knew, I knew Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. And the whole time he's preaching on 1 John chapter 5, and I'm reading out of John chapter 5, I thought the man was a heretic. Amen. <laughs> Uh, but uh, I, I, you know what my problem was? I didn't know anything. I didn't know anything. And uh, there's a lot of people out there, pray, uh, they, just, they just don't know. They don't know. And, they, and, they, and, 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 and if we would just tell them, they would know. They would know. 
And friend, I want to tell you that's what we ought to be doing because without the knowledge of God, you can't be saved. But let me say all this, this next, number two, without the knowledge of God, you can't recognize truth. Now listen, uh, go with me to uh, Matthew 22. I want you to see this, okay? <clears throat> Jesus rebuked his people a couple times during his earthly ministry. And uh, this one is really good. This is one that when I was in Bible college, this, this verse haunted me. And um, verse 23, the, the Sadducees come to Jesus and start asking really dumb questions. In my, and that is just my opinion, but I think this is a dumb question, okay? Matthew 22, look in verse number 23. Are you there? All right. The same day came to him the Sadducees, which say there is no resurrection, and, and asked him, saying, Mo, uh, Master Moses said, If a man die having no children, his brother shall marry his wife and raise up seed unto his brother. And uh, now there were uh, with us seven brethren. The first, he had married a wife deceased, and having no issue, left his wife to his brother. Likewise, the second, also the third unto the seventh. Now, can I, can I pause right there? That's a dumb question. Do, do you find that weird? Like, I'm just like, what? Like, that's just, and, 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 and trust me, I get a lot of dumb questions online. Just people just, and, and, and the problem with people, you, you can tell a lot about a person by the kind of questions they ask. Um, and I be patient with people. Trust me, I try to be patient with people. But that's a dumb question. Look what Jesus said to them in verse number 29. Jesus answered and said to them, Ye do err, not knowing the scriptures. Now, these are religious leaders, and they're, 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 you can just, I mean, just, you can just look into their mind of where they're at by the question they're asking, and you realize these people are so far off, it's crazy. And he says, you do err not knowing the scriptures nor the power of God. I want to tell you, that's the problem with a lot of people today. That's the problem with a lot of churches today. They're in theological error because they don't know anything about this book right here. A lot of churches are getting up and preaching psychology and calling it Christianity, and it's no such thing. It's nonsense is what it is. And I want to tell you right now that, there, that there's people out there that are getting into all kinds of crazy theological nonsense, getting into stuff like Hebrew roots and getting into all this flat earth. And, and there's, there's, a, there's a, I mean, I was on the phone with a guy yesterday for an hour and he was giving me some stuff that he's dealing with. And I'm thinking, where do people get this stuff? This is loony town, man. Well, they get it because they err not knowing the scriptures. And I want to tell you something, if you don't know this Bible right here, you're not going to be able to spot error when you see it. You're not going to be able to understand. Uh, I mean, I, I, I preach against Stephen Furtick, and I preach against Kenneth Copeland, because those men are literally just crazy. Like they preach some of the, not only do they preach heresy, they preach some of the stupidest things I've ever heard in my life. And people are just like, that's so good. No, it wasn't. It was dumb. That was, that's, that's not even what the Bible says. But the problem today is that people don't have any knowledge. They don't have any wisdom. They don't have any understanding. And because they have none of those things, they place no value on those things. They do err, not knowing the scriptures. Go with me to Romans chapter 16. I think I lost a few of you on that one. That's all right. I came here preaching it and I leave here preaching it. Hey, man, well, you know, that's, that sounds good when you're not at your home church. And, uh, you know. Romans chapter 16, I want you to see this. Um, in verse number 17, Romans 16, 17 says this, Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned, and avoid them. Meaning this, uh, if, they're, if they're preaching baptismal regeneration, like the Duck Dynasty crowd does, we ought not be going to their conferences. I mean, they, they, they sent their little beauty queen daughter out, uh, uh, Sadie Robertson, and she, that, that girl's going around preaching baptismal regeneration to some little, uh, I mean, she's like, what, 22 years old, going around as a, as a full-time preacher all across America, preaching baptismal regeneration. Not only is she a heretic, she's like low IQ heretic, which is the worst kind, and people are going for it. And people are buying into that stuff, and I'm thinking, what is wrong with you people? And the Bible says for me to mark them. 
meaning publicly, publicly call their name and tell people, do not mess with that. Amen. For example, if there was a restaurant in Shepherdsville, Kentucky, and everybody who ate there last week died, and I knew about it, would you want me to tell you? It wasn't Salsaritas, praise God. That place has blessed me. <laughs> oh, amen. And um, I love Mexican food, sorry. And, um, but, 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 you know, let's just say there was a restaurant in town there. Everybody this past week ate there. They died. Would you want me to tell you? You'd want to avoid that, wouldn't you? I, would I wouldn't want my family going in there eating that food and dying. Well, the same is true of these preachers. People who swallow what Stephen Furtick is serving, you will perish. People that are swallowing what Kenneth Copeland is serving, you will suffer and you will perish and I'm going to mark them publicly and I'm going to avoid them and I'm going to tell you to avoid them as well. Look what it says. Here's the only reason these people have a following. Verse number, uh, number 18. For they are such, serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly. By the way, if, if a man gets to where he's worth about $100 million dollars, and he's, and he's, I mean, I'm not, I'm not a socialist, I'm not a communist, but when a man gets like uber, uber wealthy and starts telling you that if you, if you give to my ministry and make me wealthy, God will in turn make you wealthy and we just do this, you know, this whole circular thing where you give me wealth and then God gives you wealth. It, it, it's funny how it never, it never seems to reciprocate back to the poor people in the pews. When they start getting that wealthy, something's wrong. It says, for they are such not serve our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly. There it is right there. And by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the who? You know what simple people are? It's not dumb people. It's people that don't have any knowledge. People who don't, look, look, look. People who don't have a basic understanding of the basics of theology are the ones who end up listening to Kenneth Copeland. People who don't have the basic understanding and the basic knowledge of of. of, of Basic doctrines like the Holy Spirit and the Trinity and God the Father and Christ are the ones who end up listening to Bethel music. Brother Dave Miller, I sat in Bible Doctrine 1 and 2. I had Bible Doctrine 1 with Tim Thomason. I had Bible Doctrine 2 with Scott Polly. And those men went backwards, forwards, upside down over the most basic stuff. And it, it, it helped me and it trained me. And I was able to, when I got out of Bible college, I was able to recognize error when I heard it because all that knowledge was given to me and all that understanding was given to me. And, and I was able to use that. But people in the pews today are going for some of the, I mean, like, like I can't believe anybody would ever listen to Greg Locke. I can't believe anybody would ever, uh, would ever get involved with like, you know, Charlie Kirk of Turning Point USA and Sean Foich and all these other. I can't believe anybody would get involved in all that, but they do. You know why? Because they're simple. If you can't see what's wrong, if you can't see what's wrong with Benny Hinn, you're simple. If you can't see what's wrong with these guys, you're simple. And the funny thing is, it says, and by good words and fair speeches. Meaning that they're nice, ooh, they're smooth. Oh, they're so smooth. And, and, and they're cool. They strut around, you know, hey, hey. You know, whereas a real true preacher, he's like, you know, all the time. But these guys are just like, hey, vote for me. You know, I mean, like, do you really think Satan was going to put a jerk in front of everybody? I mean, do you, did you really think Satan was going to put a very unlikable personality as his showpiece to deceive people? Let's be real. Satan's smarter than that. Good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of those who have no knowledge of God. So without knowledge, without the knowledge of God, you can't get saved. Thank God that somebody gave me some knowledge one day. But without the knowledge of God, you can't recognize truth from error. Oh, we're living in that day, aren't we? There's a lot of people down in Lebanon Injunction right now to being led into error. And I can't, I, I can't believe, I cannot believe that the people in the pews are going for that. I mean, I, I want to think, are you crazy? But you know what it is? It's a cute little blue-eyed blue, blue -eyed boy with long eyelashes leading them down the road. And they're going for it. Sad. But the Bible says they're simple. Let me give this number three since somebody ain't listening no more. Knowledge helps you. Without knowledge, you can't get saved. Without the knowledge of God, you can't recognize truth. But number three, without the knowledge of God, you can't please the Lord. I'm going to give you a... Can, can, I, 
give you a funny verse. Just first, first Peter three. I want, I want to go there. Here, here we go. I'm, I'm, this, this is kind of a maybe an unconventional take on this, but I, I think it applies. First Peter chapter three. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm going to talk to you husbands for a minute. This, this is a good illustration, but it's, it's the same word, but it proves my point. Um, I, this is this is so. This is I read First Peter chapter three, and I, I I understand the society that I live in now, and I realize how out of place this is for modern society. But I'm going to read it to you because it's it's just what the Bible says. Um, First Peter chapter three verse five talks about husband and wife relationships. Here it says, "For after this manner in the old time, the holy women also who trusted in God adorned themselves, being in subjection to their own husbands." That doesn't sound right, does it? That just sounds so weird today, being a subjection to their husbands. Look what it says there, verse number six. Even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. Does you, my wife doesn't call me Lord. I'm, from now on, I'm Lord. I'm in trouble. Does anybody know a one-bedroom apartment I can rent? Oh, uh, yeah. You, you got an extra red room I can borrow for about six weeks. Um, okay. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Yeah, I'm in trouble. Um, whose daughters you are as long as you do well and not afraid with, with any amazement. Uh, verse number seven says, likewise, your husbands dwell with them according to what? Knowledge. Knowledge. Meaning this, that, uh, that uh, as a husband, you got to learn to do things and live in such a way that you you don't aggravate your wife, you know. Like, you, you, you know, you can't say "Call me Lord" in front of everybody at the church, you know. You you can't do that stuff, you know. Um, I, I I went from living in a dormitory at Crown College full of dudes that were horrible creatures. I could and none of them were in the ministry. And I said, "Thank God," you know, to living with this woman in a trailer in Tennessee. And I, I had, to, had to learn how to be a husband. I had, had to learn how to dwell with a wife according to knowledge. And a man, a man who lives with his wife who just does whatever he wants and just doesn't care what his wife thinks and just, hey, woman, you know, you're, you're not a biblical husband. You're just not. You know what you are? You're, a, you're, a, you're an ogre is what you are. I feel bad for your wife because she's not married to anything but an ogre. Oh, yeah, I do what I want. Yeah, right. I heard a young single evangelist one time, and he's like, uh, he was preaching at a youth rally, and it was so funny because he, he was young and full of zeal, and he wasn't married yet, and he kept saying, praise God, ain't no woman ever going to tell me what to do. I thought, this guy's not married, you know, <laughs> and uh, praise the Lord. Women tell me what to do all the time, amen. I never feel like I'm in charge. Um, the Bible says for a husband to dwell, dwell with his wife, According to knowledge, meaning you got to learn what she likes, what she doesn't like, and you've got to learn and choose because you love her to do the things that she does like and to not do the things that she doesn't like. You got quiet on that one. <laughs> Brother Sean, I don't, I don't think anybody likes me anymore. And listen, the same word of knowledge is used about our relationship with God. If you're going to have the knowledge of God, if you want to please God with your life, you're going to have to get in this book and dig in this book, and you're going to have to find out what God is like, what God hates. I'll tell you something God hates. God hates gossip in the local church. God hates these foul, bitter-spirited people in the church. <laughs> that choir special wasn't that good. Them kids were annoying. Well, yeah, they're your kids. That's why, you know. <laughs> They learned it from you. I mean, I don't know. God hates that. God hates that. And the reason they do that is because they don't care what God thinks. They're just going to do whatever they want. And, and if you just do, like, just like in a, in a marriage, if you just do whatever you want and just, ah, if you, you we don't like it, there's the door. You do that in a marriage, you're not going to be happy. And if you do that with God, you're not going to please the Lord. Can I show you another verse here? I want you to go, um, let's go over to Jeremiah chapter 4. I want you to see this, all right? Jeremiah is somewhere in the Old Testament back there. It's 
been a long time since I heard a sermon out of the book of Jeremiah, but I'm going to give you a little bit out of Jeremiah today. The basic premise of the whole book of Jeremiah is that Jeremiah is preaching to a, a, a nation that has completely forsaken God. They're not listening. God's speaking. They're not listening. They're doing their own things. And they've even convinced themselves that they are right with God. And, and, and you can get so backslidden on the Lord that you actually think that you're right with God. And, and there's churches that are filled with these people. And the Bible says in Jeremiah chapter number 4 and verse number 21. Let's go there. The Bible says, How long shall I see the standard and hear the sound of the trumpet? For my people is foolish. They have not known me. That's a sad thing, isn't it? They don't know anything about me. And, and here's a funny word. They are sottish children. I have no idea what that means, but it doesn't sound flattering, does it? Sottish children. That's going to be my new insult at home. You are a sottish child. <laughs> sottish. Don't call your wife that, sir. They are sottish children, and they have none. There it is. What's that word right there? They have none. There, well, there it is again. Wow. They are wise to do evil. But to do good, they have no knowledge. That's sad, isn't it? These people have been, like, like these people have been raised in the nation of Israel, and they have no idea who God is. There's people that have been in church my whole life, been, but they've been in church longer than I've been alive. And they don't even know how, they don't even have enough bi biblical knowledge to take a Bible and lead somebody else to the Lord. They are wise to do evil, but to do good they have no knowledge. There are a lot of churches today, and I, I've, I've, been, I've been in contact with people just trying, to, just trying to help churches out there. Uh, there are churches in this country that their pastor either had to resign because of health issues or, uh, or you know, he just, he, just, he just left, took another ministry somewhere. And, and, and there's people, the man's been pastoring for I don't know how many years, and, and, and he has to step out for some circumstance, and the people in the pews have no idea what to do. They don't even know what to look for in a preacher. And so because of that, they get some little slick dude with a seminary degree who is carnal. He's a, he's a charlatan. He's a hireling. And he takes the church into some strange direction. And, and they don't even know what they've done. They don't even realize the doom that they have given to their own grandchildren. They have no idea what God expects of a church. They have no idea what a church should look like. And they have no idea what kind of things they should look for in a pastor. They don't even understand the biblical concepts of a pastor. But they understand football. And they understand the NFL. And they understand college football. And they understand all the worldly sinful things. But when it comes to something simple like what to look for in a new pastor, they have no idea. It's because... Verse, verse, look, look at the beginning of verse number 22. The Bible says, For my people is foolish, foolish people in the pew, who have no wisdom, no understanding, no knowledge, but bless the Lord, they get up and put a tie on every Sunday morning, and they geographically walk into a location that is called a local church, but throughout the week they've never read their Bible, they don't know anything about God, they don't know any Bible doctrine, and so some man can get up and preach a bunch of heresy to them and lead them down a road that'll, that'll doom their own grandchildren to hell and lead them into compromise and a sin, and they have no idea that it's even happening. My people have not known me. They are wise to do evil, but to do good, they have no knowledge. Let's go to Hosea, just a few pages over. Hosea. <clears throat> this is a famous verse that uh, everybody likes to talk about. And Hosea is a pretty similar situation. He's, um, he's speaking to a nation that's forsaken God, gone away from the Lord. And in Hosea chapter number 4, And you'll see, as we read this, you'll see a lot of parallels between Israel back then and America today. It says right there in Hosea chapter 4, verse number 1, Hear the word of the Lord, you children of Israel, for the Lord hath a controversy with the inhabitants of the land. That's, a, wow. Because there is no truth, nor mercy, nor, what's that word? Knowledge, Knowledge of God in the land. There's none. You guys are going through the formality of all. And I think that's true of churches. There's no truth. 
There's no mercy and there's no knowledge of God in the church. Look, it says verse number six. And this is, this is a verse that a lot of people like to quote. Isaiah 4, or excuse me, Hosea 4, 6. My people are destroyed for lack of what? Knowledge. knowledge. Because thou hast rejected knowledge, I will also reject thee. That thou shalt be no priest to me, seeing thou hast forgotten the law of God, I will also forget thy... Wow. I'll forget thy children. That's, that's heavy stuff. God's, when, God's not just throwing empty threats and platitudes around. God means it. You don't want to know me? Go do whatever you want. And there are a lot of churches out there that are doing whatever they want. And it's a sad thing. Friend, I want to tell you, we need the knowledge of God. I start in Proverbs 2, let's end in Proverbs chapter 2. We need to know God. We need to get in this book and study this book and, and, and value what this book says and, and, and be away with this, this foolish preaching that I hear all across this country where people read one verse and then get up and tell a bunch of stories for 40 minutes about how great they are and how much of a hero, that, hero they are. I'm going to tell you, we need to be away with that kind of stuff and get back into this book, back into Bible doctrine. And Proverbs chapter 2, verse 1, the Bible says... My son, if thou wilt receive my words and hide my commandments with thee, so that thou incline thine ear unto wisdom and apply thine heart unto understanding. Yea, if thou criest after knowledge and lift up thy voice for understanding, if thou seekest her as silver and searchest for her as for hid treasures, then thou shalt understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. The first step in finding the knowledge of God is admitting that you're a sinner and that you're not saved. That's the first step. The second step in finding the knowledge of God is getting alone with God and saying, God, teach me this book. Show me what's in this book. Teach me what the Bible says. Lord, help me. I want to be like Paul said in Philippians 3.10, that I may know thee and the power of thy resurrection. We've got people in churches today that they, they know how to put a tie on. They know how to put a suit on. They know how to sing. They know how to, they know how to perform in a choir. But do they know God? Do they know him personally? That's the question today. I want to ask somebody to come play this piano for us, and we'll give an invitation uh, this morning. But I want to tell you this, friend. We need to get back to where we're knowing God. And we, spoke, we spoke Wednesday night about understanding. Today we spoke about knowledge, but tonight we're going to speak about wisdom. And I think we'll find that these things are so valuable, they're so important, and the Bible says seek for them as you would for silver. If I told you there was gold bars worth $150,000 strewn across this property, you know what some of y'all would be doing? Y'all wouldn't be in here hearing me preach. Y'all would be out in the yard with shovels, wouldn't you? And, and I told you there's there there 200 gold bars on this property hidden somewhere. Each one is worth $150,000. Go find them. Y'all wouldn't be in here. But the Bible says the knowledge of God, you ought to seek for that as you're seeking for silver. Seek God. Seek knowledge. Let's pray and, and uh, we'll have an invitation. Father, bless this time now. Speak to our hearts and use us for your glory. I pray you help us tonight. Help us, Lord, to know you, to have knowledge, to walk with God. In Jesus' name. Let's all stand together, if we will. The altar is open. Will grace be sufficient? Oh, how will I know the next time my heart is broken? Will it be mended? Will I have a promise that tells me it's so? I just go back to the moment he saved me. I just go back to every prayer he's answered for me. And then I won't have to worry about my next blessing. The past is a promise, I'll have all that I need. Did he deliver Moses? Did he comfort Elijah? 
was David a part of this promise to me? And did God's son rise out of Judah? Did he walk up Golgotha? The past holds the power of this promise to me. And I just go back to the moment he saved me. I just go back to every prayer he's answered for me. And then I won't have to worry about my next blessing. The past is a promise. I have all that I need. Then I won't have to worry about my next blessing. The past is a promise. I have all that I need. Well, hey guys, your friend Spencer here. Not long ago, the Lord laid it on my heart to do a book for children that would explain the gospel in a fun and exciting way so that they could understand what it is to truly be saved and born again. Y'all pray for me. The Lord's laid it on my heart to do a, a coloring book for kids. And what I want to do is do ABCs of gospel terms. And so we started working with some people at our church to put together a book just for children. And we are thrilled to announce to you that Mr. Gizmo's gospel coloring book is now available on Amazon. This book contains over 100 pages of pictures that you can color and an A to Z glossary of gospel terms directly from the Bible. There also are some activities in the back like mazes, connect the dots, and other fun stuff. All of these images are hand-drawn and are fun and exciting for children, and it's a great tool to teach them the gospel. Be one of the first to get your copy of Mr. Gizmo's Gospel Coloring Book. I guarantee you, you will love this book. It's going to be awesome. What do you think of this book, Mr. Gizmo? He loves it. He loves it. I knew you would. Parents, take the time to sit down with your children and read this book to them. They will really enjoy the things that are in it, and I know that you will too. So go ahead and get your copy today. God bless you, friend. We love you, and we'll see you very soon. I think it looks just like you, Mr. Gizmo just like you. <laughs>